Thank you, Pamela. This just in. Jason Edwards told Wilson Henninger, who then informed Emily Berg, that then told our cameraman that Trevor Borchardt was just recently walking down Main Street in Johnson City and he was clipped by a Boeing 747 due to his tall height. He is currently in the hospital suffering minor concussions. So the Greater Binghamton Airport is now requiring Trevor to notify the airport every time he leaves his house from here on out. He is considered a threat to all low-flying planes in the, in the Broome County area. And that sums it up for our New Visions Gossip segment. Now if you're just joining us tonight, this is Nightly News with Nicholas Pert on CBS. And this brings us to our main story tonight, which is a more serious topic about the ethical issues regarding solitary confinement. Now, in order to do that, we have to figure out where solitary confinement originated. Knowing that, we can figure out how it has turned into something ethically wrong. Back in the early 1800s, Quakers used it so that their prisoners could seek forgiveness from God. They would be in solitary confinement for six to eight hours a day and up to a week in extreme cases. Now, that was the case from the early 1800s all the way through to the 20th century until it started to morph into something that's become ethically wrong. Solitary confinement is now used for a month and up to years and years and years in extreme cases. And not only is it not six to eight hours a day, it can be up to 23 hours a day with only one remaining hour for fresh air, as they say. There are three main ethical issues regarding solitary confinement. The first is that solitary confinement disregards basic human rights given to us through the Constitution. The second is that it introduces mental illnesses to people who are in solitary confinement. And if they had mental illnesses prior to solitary confinement, their conditions are exacerbated. The third is that these cells that they live in are virtually uninhabitable. Now we will also look at counter arguments regarding these topics. Now let's look at the first ethical issue regarding solitary confinement. It's human rights violations. Now the United Nations created a human rights community, or HRC, to provide an exact interpretation of what the Constitution actually means. Now it's stated that no detained or imprisoned person can even be temporarily deprived of its natural senses, such as sight or hearing. Now these prisoners are being placed in dark, windowless, and even soundproof cells for extended periods of time, which, according to the United Nations Human Rights Committee, it's torture. Now let's set aside that for a second, and let's look at human rights issues found in the selection of who is placed into solitary confinement. What used to be a punishment for dangerous criminals and those who would harm themselves or others has now turned into a control strategy of first resort for jail guards. For example, a group of Rastafarian men were placed in solitary confinement for up to a decade because they would not cut their hair on religious grounds. The guards did not approve of that and they placed them in solitary confinement. There are countless examples of guards placing inmates into solitary cells for aspects of the person that are protected by human rights. For example, guards have placed men and women into solitary confinement for having too many pencils in their cells, for being gay or transgender, or even having religious beliefs that guards did not approve of. This is basically just like burning up the Constitution. Not only is that disregarding unalienable rights, it's discrimination. And it's publicly allowed in jails all around the United States. If there are human rights violations and discrimination surrounding solitary confinement, why do we do it? Well, as a society, we say it's effective. And is it? Well, yes. It's effective in stopping the dangerous prisoner from harming other prison guards or other inmates. But how effective is it? Studies have shown it's not too effective because it brings up issues that were non-existent prior to having solitary confinement. One, it causes increased suicide and self-mutilation rates. Solitary confinement also costs a lot of money. People don't really realize it, but it costs upwards of $75,000 to house one prisoner in a supermax solitary cell for a year. That's disregarding the price that it takes to train a prison guard in how to deal with a solitary inmate. Studies have also shown that prisoners who are let out of solitary cells are no less dangerous than those who leave regular cells. If it's spending all this taxpayer money and you're not gaining anything from it, how effective is it? Aside from the ineffectiveness and the blatant disregard for human rights, solitary confinement also poses another issue. Mental illnesses. 
to prove this, back in the 1950s, Harry Harlow, who was a psychologist for the University of Wisconsin, decided to create a study. What he did was he took monkeys, Reese's monkeys, and he put them in what he created, which was called the Pyramid of Doom, which was an upside-down cone-shaped like structure in which he placed the monkeys in. He rubbed lots of oil and grease around the insides, and so it was nearly impossible to climb out of. And after only two days, guess what happened? Well, some tried banging their heads against the walls to try to kill themselves because they had given up. They would rather die than be in the pain that they were in. And one, he left in the Pyramid of Doom for 12 months. And after that, he was socially obliterated and he could not function at all. Well, many critics of this test said monkeys and humans are two completely different things. So how could what happened to a monkey accurately depict what happened to a human? In order to silence these critics, a group of McGill researchers, a year later in 1951, decided to create a study with actual humans. So they took six graduate students, put gloves on their hands, blacked out sunglasses on their eyes and earmuffs on their ears in order to limit their senses. They placed them in solitary chambers for what was going to be six weeks. Well, they had to stop it short five weeks short because people in this study were showing extreme signs of mental illnesses sleep apnea, vivid hallucinations, and even the ability to function. That was considered factual evidence that mental illnesses do occur when humans are placed in solitary confinement. Aside from the ethical issues surrounding mental illnesses, which are created by solitary confinement, the solitary cells, they're virtually uninhabitable. Now, let's look at an average American's home. 2,700 square feet, which is about 60 by 40 feet. Here at the studio, we've created a to scale model out of Legos of what the average American lives in every day. Now, let's set that down. This is what the average solitary confinement prisoner lives in, six by four, sometimes up to six by nine. There's a bed in the same room that there's a toilet and a sink, all in this windowless, non-ventilated room. How could this be an issue? If you're going to the bathroom in the same room that you're living and there's no ventilation, you're breathing that same stale air that you're using when you're going to the bathroom. This is a huge issue because there's rarely any maintenance on these cells, so they're not going to be cleaned out for sometimes months, sometimes years. Aside from the lack of ventilation, there are no windows in this room, so it's completely dark, except for one light hanging from the ceiling, which is on 24-7. So in the corners of these rooms, attracts a lot of fungus and mildew which can create very unhealthy atmosphere for the prisoners to live in. Well there you have it folks. Solitary confinement is one of the worst ethical issues that we have not solved. And how can we solve it? Well, some people suggest short-term solitary confinement. Maybe it's the fact that it's months to even years that causes these issues. No, because if we look back at the 1951 McGill University test, what did we find? we find that up to one week caused these students to have sleep apnea, vivid hallucinations, and even lose the ability to function. So no, it's not the fact that it's long term, it's the fact that solitary confinement itself, no matter how long or short, is the issue. So what we really need to do is get rid of it completely because the discrimination and the human rights violations that go into placing people in there, coupled with the lack of effectiveness of the system itself, and you add on top mental illnesses and uninhabitability of the cells, well, we've got an issue that we need to erase. So thank you very much for being with us tonight. This is Nightly News with Nicholas Pert on CBS. And here's just a quick word from our sponsor. Whew, long day at work. You ever had a long day at work and been really tired and just want to relax? you know, get a coffee, get something to eat. Well, you came to the right place because with off-brand Cheerios called Crispy Oats, the best way to clench your mid-afternoon hunger. So stop on down to Aldi's and pay half the price for a load of garbage.